discussion of oxides, Roman numeral 8, with two special oxides that can have their biggest mineralogical significance because their ability to be used as gemstones. And those two minerals are corundum and spinel. Let's start off with corundum, and we can put a little here like four gemstones as a little mini heading as we're organizing these notes. The chemical formula for corundum is Al2O3, and it's basically just pure aluminum. There will be impurities, as I'm tipping my hand a little bit, and those impurities are going to be what gives it the corundum the color that we can call sapphire and ruby. Our mineralogy of corundum is very important for its geologic concurrence and for its value. So let's go with mineralogy. Our hardness is 9, which means it can be worn as jewelry and it does not break down in the detrital environment. And a specific gravity, or heft, is four, and both of these are really high for a non-metallic mineral. So these are both relatively high minerals or, or, or values, and that is one of the reasons why this can be worth so much. Uh, what other things should we talk about as a mineralogy? The crystal form, I think that's important. In fact, I'll show a picture to you, and I'll have you maybe draw this right next to it. This is the crystal form for a classic corundum. And what you want to see here is a tapering, barrel-shaped, hexagonal prism. And let's go ahead and write those words down. Is that hexagonal, tapering, tapering. Tapering means fat in the middle and thinner at the sides, prisms. Sometimes people call these barrels. So let's go barrels. And the reason why they're calling them barrels is, so here's the top of our hexagonal prism, right? And what you want to do is you kind of, if you can have this kind of go out fat and then come back down, go out fat and come back down as it meets in with the base there. And then this kind of curls out. And the other thing we're going to see in this, and you can see it here, look at these horizontal marks. These are very pronounced striations, and so if you were to put in a sketch of your own, have it be something like this, with these striations marked and the curvature of the barrels. In the mineral trade, this is what is seen. Actually, in the rock record, so that we're going to say in mineralogy. Although in geology, the thing that's most common is actually just massive granular. But you're not going to see that in mineralogy classes because most people are treating this as if it's a gemstone. And so they're going to try to show you the most spectacular uh, crystal forms possible. So in geology, massive is most common. So this is for all of corundum, not just ruby or not just sapphire, like I've shown here with the blue coloration. The, the horizontal striations may be a prominent basal parting because that is the main way that these prisms break. And so here's like a face that may be a crystal face or it may be a parting face. It's actually pretty hard to tell. And all these striations across, maybe they're twins, maybe they're polysynthetic twins, or maybe it's a basal parting. So I just want you to have all those things in your mind as possibilities. And we're going to write that down here as that there is a prominent basal parting. And there is also, let's just go, com or, uh, let's go kind of like comma thing, also polysynthetic twinning is possible. Let me see if I can show you some pictures of this basal parting. There's our tapering hexagonal, and if you were to break that tapering hexagonal prism along the basal parting, which is perpendicular to the C-axis, you're going to get your corundum crystal to break into these little slabs. And this is one way that corundum is pulled out of the ground. And so it actually has a big impact to faceting because there's no depth to these little plates, making the gemstones that are cut have to be a little smaller than you might think they need to be in order to fit in the size of these thin basal parted plates of, in this situation, this is like a pink sapphire, or if you wanted to call it a ruby, you could, but I think it's a little too pink and not enough red for that. Although I'm not going to get annoying about color, even though a gemologist certainly would. One of the rules about corundum is that any color is possible. And if it has a specific color, then names can occur. So sapphire is the, is the name for basically everything. 
If it's yellow, it's called a sapphire. If it's pink, it's called a sapphire. Uh, but most of the time when it is called a sapphire, oh, if it's green, it could be a sapphire. But most of the time when we think of sapphire, we think of blue, although all other colors are possible within the name sapphire. And this is from Fe2 plus and titanium 4 plus substituting in for aluminum 3 plus. And it has to maintain a tar charge balance, which is why there's a 4 and a 2. Now, ruby is exclusively used for red. And this comes from chromium 3 plus acting in exchange with aluminum 3 plus. That's part of the exchange mechanism at the PPM level. In fact, let's put that in. PPM level. That is controlling the color of sapphire. Now, one of the other really neat facts or observations about the mineralogy. Oh, should I put some pictures in? Oh yeah, definitely should put this picture in. Look at the stunning blue color of this sapphire and this beautiful red of ruby. But let's move on. And I want to show you this. This is the last thing about the mineralogy that I wanted to talk about. And it is the presence of rutile needles that are very common. So we're still under mineralogy and what we can get is this phenomenon called asterism. Asterism, or sometimes it's called star sapphire. And what we get is these rutile needles. Rutile needles, which rutile is an oxide, it's TiO2. We're not going to talk about it, although it is part of uh, most mineralogy classes. So they get rutile needles that grow along crystallographic orientations. And so if you look at this picture zoomed in, you can see how they're following the hexagonal crystal structure. And it's all these little needles that ref um, reflect light in such a way to produce these six-rayed stars. So this is kind of a neat uh, intergrowth of minerals that can be very prominent in sapphires and rubies of any color. So the geology to make corundum, or let's say to find corundum, because there are these two different geologic occurrences, one is detrital. And this is more about finding than making, because it has a hardness of nine and it has a specific gravity of four, there is fantastic survivability. And so you can find it in these placer deposits. But this is a secondary process that has to be related to some primary process. And so it ends up being that corundum can form in a variety of different places as long as you are very silica poor. That is the most important fact about the formation of corundum, is if you have a silica poor igneous rock, or metamorphic rock, maybe like a marble, would be a good example with a lot of calcium, but it doesn't have much silica, then you can end up crystallizing aluminum and oxygen, right? So, so that's what is important. We need to be able to bond aluminum to oxygen without silica getting in the way. If we had silica, then you'd end up having silica bonded with aluminum with oxygen, and you would make something like feldspars or micas. So we have to have an environment with aluminum bonded with oxygen without silica, or we would make feldspars and mica, two very common minerals. We call them rock forming minerals. In the United States, there are some environments where you actually can produce this, and they're really all in the state of Montana. So this is just kind of a neat trivia thing. It's a lot of my audience is based here stateside, and certainly my classes as well, is that there are these four locations in the state of Montana where detrital um, sapphires have been found and have been mined for hundreds of years. If you're ever in that area of Montana, go do a day trip and be a tourist and hunt for sapphires. And you can actually find uh, something like this in a day's haul, where there are most of the Montana sapphires are this greenish to teal color, but there are some other beautiful colors that you can find in Montana too. Now there's one picture that's sitting over here on my desktop that looks like I forgot to add to my lecture. So we might as well throw it in because it was probably pretty interesting. Oh, yeah. These are just pictures showing the different geologic occurrences of corundum. So here's an example uh, from Madagascar where there are a lot of ruby deposits that are being pulled out of detrital environments. So this would be a place where ruby might be heavily enriched along this conglomerate layer. Or here is like the actual native rock 
where rubies are weathering out of a metamorphic rock that's very poor in silica. So that's it for corundum. I feel like I can talk about it forever because I do love gemstones, but there's no more time for that. We must move on to spinel. Spinel is a really interesting mineral because it, for hundreds of years, everyone has basically confused spinel with corundum because it shares so many traits in common. In fact, here's probably the most famous spinel on earth. It's called the Black Prince's Ruby. The Black Prince's Ruby is right here and is located in the crown jewels of England and it's sitting above one of the world's most famous diamonds, the Cullinan II, but let's ignore that for today. We're not talking about diamonds. Instead, we're talking about spinel. And so this has actually been called a ruby throughout much of history. It actually is first mentioned in like the late 1300s and has a long and tragic history of being traded for war and then killed. The person has it is killed, yada, yada, yada. Now it's just sitting in the crown jewels. But the reason why this could be confused with a ruby is because it has a very similar formula. It forms in the same type of geologic environments. It has the same color. It has almost the same hardness. Anyways, there's a ton of stuff that's very similar. So let's go through spinel and let's emphasize some of those aspects that are also similar to corundum. It has a hardness of eight, so it's just a little softer. It has a specific gravity of about 3.6, so it's a little lighter, but still close enough that if you weren't careful, you might be able to confuse it. Now one of the big differences between spinel and corundum is that spinel is isometric and when it crystallizes it loves to form octahedrons. This is one of the classic, thing, classic things you're going to look for when you're making an identification of spinel in this class. I'm almost sure to show it to you like this, where the crystals are going to be tiny. That's one of the aspects that we could actually probably put here, is that that tends to be rather small. But these really small crystals can be stunningly beautiful, showing up as octahedrons. Uh, another thing about the mineralogy is that it can occur in any color. It's colored by chromophores, and they're similar to things like ruby. So like this red coloration we have above, this is from the chrome added. If you have blue, this is from iron, maybe cobalt sometimes as well. So it, and there's a whole, whole host of other colors. Gray and lavender were actually really hot in 2020 as one of the um, biggest colors that jewelers were trying to sell and that the population was buying. Our geology Let's see, wait, do we have a little arrow? No, we don't do that. We go to and we go geology. The geology of spinel is the same as corundum as well. Basically, because it is hard and is heavy, it can certainly be enriched in detrital environments, making the placer deposits. And then also you will you can form it in places that are very silica poor. In this case, it tends to be silica poor metamorphic rocks rather than both igneous. So that's the geology that I want you to know, and I could show you, we'll finish off with just this one picture. Here's a picture of a marble. We can see the white calcite and the beautiful pink spinels that are crystallizing inside of the silica pore metamorphic rock. In fact, down here, you can almost start to see one of the octahedrons as it grew.